If you have a Facebook group, you know that going through those membership questions for all the member requests is tedious. And as a girl who really just wants to be as lazy as possible and take a nap with her dog, I want to automate those things as best I can. So I use a tool called Group Collector. Now I've been testing this for over a month and so I wanted to record a tutorial on exactly how I use it, how I'm enjoying it, and if I think it is worth it for you to get. We're going to go through the pros and cons of the software. The thing about it that genuinely nearly sent me <laughs> into like some sort of like an anxiety ADHD spiral. Um, and ultimately how I got myself out of that spiral and what I learned so that you don't end up in that spiral. If you don't know me, hi, my name is Nina Clapperton. I'm the founder of She Knows SEO, and I love showing up here for y'all every week. Now that we're back after our summer break, this is so exciting. <laughs> um, if you're watching this later, I took a summer break, <laughs> um, to share some more tool tips and tricks with you guys. So today we're going to do an in-depth walkthrough. If you've watched any of mine before, you know that we're going to get into the nitty gritty and really show you exactly how to use this product. Then we're going to talk about whether or not I think it's a good fit for people and a way that you can save some money on it because I am also a budget girly. So I am all about saving money wherever you can. Before we jump right into the video, if you haven't gotten it already, I have a free SEO audit checklist that is going to help you go through your site and get more organic traffic. It's going to help you overhaul what you already have and just improve it. This is a step-by-step -step walkthrough, so you can find that link to get that down in the description of this video. And now if you guys are ready, let's go learn about Group Collector. This is the back end of Group Collector. Now, I only have two of my many, many, many Facebook groups here because privacy. So I've gotten rid of them um, for the sake of recording this video. And I'm sure I'm gonna regret that when I have to go and add them back in. <laughs> But here you can see uh, that I have it running on a couple of my groups. Now, the way that Group Collector essentially works is twofold. So number one, it's going to make a Google Sheet for that like basically is like auto-populated for you. I made a dummy version where I got rid of any identifying information, but this is um, a real person's answers to my membership questions. So you can see that it's collecting all of the data from your questions, Q1, Q2, and Q3, um, that then is going to be stored here. Now, what it's also doing is then taking any information of that, basically one of your questions should ask them for an email to do this. Um, it's gonna take that email address and then send it to your email marketing software. So traditionally, you would have had to do this manually. Now there are like, there are other platforms that do this. I'm not saying that like, we've been in the stone age until literally today. <laughs> but I mean like back, back, back in the day. And even like, I was doing this manually a year ago because I didn't think it was necessarily worth paying for something to do it. So it's very much up to you. I will say this has been, I didn't realize how much time it would save me. <laughs> so we will talk a bit more about like the pros and cons though, because I think everything has cons as well. So it is sending it to your newsletter and that means you're going to get more subscribers. Now it does also have the feature where it can auto approve people um, like members of your group. We'll talk about that as well, because that's the main spot that I would say my, um, trepidation comes in to use a $3 word. <laughs> so basically the way that you're going to create a group is you're going to click add a new group. So let's set up um, a group collector for one of my new groups for the now boarding bundle. So we're going to call it now boarding bundle because it's the name of it. And then we're going to put in the URL. So we're going to create the group and then this is going to add it to our list here. Now you'll see it says add and add where on my other ones it says edit. That's because we need to create the Google sheet. So you're going to click add and then this is going to give you a Google sheet that you need to make a copy of. So you're going to want to click on that. It's going to open in a new tab and then file, make a copy. Then what I like to do is rather than just having it as copy of da 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 da, I do the name of the group. So now boarding bundle hyphen, and then that keeps it all together for me. And then I know which group it's for. <laughs> so that's gonna help us keep it, um, yeah, keep it kind of sane. So if you go back, you can see it also says, do not rename the sheet name in Google Sheet. So it's called sheet one, and we do not wanna hide column A. So you wanna make sure that basically other than changing the actual name, don't really change stuff in this. That's gonna just like keep it, um, yeah, actually make sure it works for you. Then you need to get the Google Sheet URL. So what you're gonna do for that is click share in the corner, and we wanna make sure that anyone with link can edit. That way it is able to um, actually put things into this. 
So now we're going to update the sheet and authenticate the Google account. Now it's going to pull up your Google emails. You're going to select the right one. Um, I'm not going to do that because I have a bunch of accounts right now. So I'm going to, we're going to skip that step just for privacy sake. Okay, so you can see that it wants to um, allow access to our Google account. So basically it wants to be able to edit things in our account. So you're going to click continue. And this is going to give it permissions to um, actually go into that sheet and add content to the sheet. So it's almost like setting up a Zapier essentially where it's going to send the information to the sheet, but it needs permission to be able to do that. Now we need to set up an autoresponder. So this is actually where it's going to connect uh, whatever email we get all the way over to our email marketing platform. So in this case, I use ConvertKit. They have a drop down of like a million different ones. I was shocked at how many things they connect to. Um, so you should be able to find whatever you're looking for here, but if not, you would connect it to Zapier and it would help you out. Um, so I select ConvertKit, then it needs my API key and an exact tag name. For your API key, if you just click on this, it's going to take you right over to it immediately. So here we are, it is your API key down here. You just click this little like copy icon and then take it back over and then that's gonna be your API key. Now I have blurred mine out, yours will not look like this, um, just to be clear so no one's like, oh, mine has actual numbers and stuff. Uh, that's why mine is a bit blurry. Now your API key essentially acts like a key to your house. So it's like giving your spare key to a friend and it's basically going to allow Group Collector to come into your ConvertKit account or your MailerLite or whatever you're using and basically add a subscriber. So it's going to manually subscribe them and it is then going to add them to a tag. So we can see here it says it needs the exact tag name. Now this is going to be, some people call it like your subscriber group or something. It depends on like what you're working with, but essentially it's like the specific group name for where these subscribers are. So for example, in mine, we go to the subscribers tab at the top, and then you're going to be able to see all of the different tags that people are in. Now I have scrolled down, that way we don't have like anyone's personal information in the middle of the screen, but you would otherwise be able to see that. So here we can see that I have a whole bunch of um, different tags, and I'm gonna pick one of them. Now with ConvertKit, you can't like drag and like get the name of it. So what I do instead is I just hover over it, right click and then click copy and it's going to copy the hyperlinked text so if you're putting it in something like a google doc it will take the hyperlink if you're just taking it here it's not going to now i picked a random one for our example because it needs to be an existing tag if it's not it's not going to work it will tell you that you put in the wrong tag name which i think is incredibly helpful so mine has this 235 five subscribers i'm going to get rid of that just that way like the actual just tag name is here and then we're going to click verify and update. Bing, bam, boom. Now it is done. So now the now boarding bundle is basically going to be collecting information from my membership question. So just for reference, my membership questions are the email you use to get the bundle and then what's your travel experience level so far. Now I might add a third one. You do get three different questions. Um, I haven't thought of which one I will do yet. So if you have ideas for another question I should ask anyone who is getting the bundle, put it in the comments. Give me some ideas, please help a girl out. <laughs> this is my first time running a bundle this big. So I need some ideas of things that I should ask people um, who are participating in the bundle. Now we also have some more settings that we can play around with. So we can create an auto approve, essentially where it is going to go into this group for me and approve people who are applying. Now with this bundle, we have over 2 million reach just from like the first few people I accepted into the bundle. So I'm very hopeful we're gonna get a lot of people, but that means that I gotta sleep. I gotta like rest my little like tired finger from clicking approve. So what I can do here is enable auto approve. And this was like a really big selling point to me for group collector is that it could do this because at a certain point, yeah, it's great that it can collect the emails. That's fine by me. But most people from my groups personally, um, they're already on my email list or they, I guess I have a serious enough tone of voice that they go and join. And it's very rare that they haven't already when I tell them it's required. So, um, for me, I haven't had a big issue there, but I know for a lot of people they have. For me, the thing that I care about is that people aren't waiting forever for me to go in and approve them. So this is great because it will automatically do it for me. Now, the thing that you do not want to turn on and that I turned on, which was a freaking disaster, is automatically focus on tab. This was such a mistake. So the main con of this, and honestly, I was going to 
this review is going to be very, very different if I hadn't learned this like two weeks ago. Um, it was driving me out of my mind. So I first got Group Collector and then I was traveling, so I didn't really notice like that it was doing this, but I had turned on automatically focus on tab. And what that means is that basically to automatically approve people, it's going to open a new tab go to the group, and then it's going to like look at the members, evaluate them with the Chrome extension, and then um, approve them or decline them. The problem is it was running every hour. So every hour it would open that tab and then it would automatically focus on it, which means that it's opening that tab as the primary tab. So if I was recording something like this, suddenly a new tab opened and I was like migrated over there. I'd be on a Zoom call like coaching somebody and then suddenly Chrome would open with a tab and it would like shift my whole screen away from what I was like literally on Zoom with somebody. So it was so frustrating. I honestly think it's such a bad idea to have it turned on. I know they say like if you have um, over 15 people because it needs to like not, basically like it'll overwhelm itself if you have more than 15 pen pending requests. I would just update your like number of minutes so that this is happening in the background because it's still gonna open a new tab, but it's not gonna like make it your focus of the screen essentially. So if I'm on a call with somebody, this can open and happen on my Chrome and it will not impact me. I won't even notice it's happening. Even right now, it could technically happen. I don't know when the next, like what hour, I guess, like what's when the 60 minutes is triggered, I haven't tracked it. Um, but it would just open in the background. We'd see a tab open, I'd wait a second, then the tab would just close. It wouldn't actually impact us, which is really great. So I recommend leaving that turned off. <laughs> And if you're going to leave it turned on, then like really up that the number of minutes. That way, like you're not getting distracted because it was an ADHD nightmare for me. Um, otherwise, I just do 60 minutes and then I let it run on its own. And then, um, like I said, it's going to trigger, but it's not going to shift my focus. So I don't really care. Then we have Facebook group member requests page URL with filters applied. So essentially it wants to know if you have like certain filters that are going to automatically allow people in. I don't really run public groups, so I haven't needed to do a lot of this. Um, with private groups, you can just skip it. But with public groups, for example, you can like select um, if men are allowed, if men aren't allowed, if women are allowed, if women aren't allowed, that sort of information. Um, I don't, yeah, I haven't really had to do it, so I kind of just skip it, to be honest. So this is the best part to me of this auto approval is that it can actually sense if there is an email in one of the questions. So most of us, when we have a group, we are asking people for their email address. This is a great idea because then it gets people off of Facebook because we do not own Facebook. It could go down at any moment, like you could get banned from it, your account could get hacked, whatever. Things happen, but if you have their email address, you're a bit safer because you have them like in your sphere off of Facebook as well. So most of us asked for that email, but the admin assist on Facebook itself can only tell if there's any sort of character or text or number or what, like just any character basically as an answer to the membership questions. Here, it can actually tell if there's an email. So the thing that I turn on like immediately is that there must be an email in an answer to any of the questions for my groups where that is a requirement. If it is not a requirement, turn that off. But I typically run kind of student only groups where I basically say if you have a freebie, you're a student, but like you got to have the freebie to be there to have gotten the freebie. You need to have given me an email. So you got to basically have, I have to have an email. <laughs> then we need them to agree to group rules. Now this admin assist can do as well within Facebook. So that's, it's kind of, I don't know. It's good that it has it, but that one wasn't revolutionary to me. Then here we can say the minimum number of questions that they must have answered. I want them to have answered all the questions. So here I have two questions, so I'm gonna have two. Um, but if you want them to answer all the questions, then it, you would put three if you have three questions. A lot of people select like locations or number of friends in groups or mutual friends, groups in common um, when they join Facebook to try and help like reduce some bot traffic. I think that like that does limit things though. I definitely think that the join Facebook before, I typically set it to one month at least because they've got to be on Facebook for a minute probably to be in the group. Um, otherwise, I find everything else quite limiting. So unless I'm going to run a group like that is Toronto specific and even then people don't always live in Toronto. So I'm like, 
I don't know. I don't think my location is set to where I live. I think I, I don't think I remember to change it ever. And I've moved a lot. So I, I think that's quite limiting. But you do have that option. Um, if that is something that you want to set, you would be able to enter a location. So let's just do like Toronto. And then basically it just needs to detect that that is in their location on their account. So you can see that like if it's, um, it doesn't do a drop down or something. So if it's a place like California, Ontario versus California, the province, or the province, the state, um, you might get some mix up there. So just be careful. Or like Paris, Ontario versus like Paris, France. Then uh, you can also have like, if there's a certain like password they need to say, this was kind of an older school technique for Facebook groups where people would be like, okay, read the rules. And in the rules, they'd be like, say Jackrabbit or something. And then that'll like get you in. Uh, it's cool that they have the feature that it'll, it'll detect it, but most people aren't really doing that anymore. Now this one was really interested to me for like pre-approved members. So something that I do with the SEO uh, roadmap is that I will take the people who have purchased on Thrivecart and then I put them um, into the Google sheet. That way it's very clear, like these are the people who have already purchased. So just let them in sort of a thing. So I don't necessarily need to do this for this group, um, but if I wanted to, I'm gonna show you guys how, just so you all know how to make it for yourself. So I like to use the same spreadsheet that I'm using to um, get the other information from Group Collector. It just keeps it in one spot for me. So what I'm going to do is add another sheet. So I press this little plus sign button in the corner, and then we have sheet two. Now you can rename this if you want to something like members, but it doesn't massively matter. Just remember what you've named it. Then it says it wants the sheet ID. So that is going to be basically in the URL. It's after this D slash all of this string of like numbers and letters uh, before the slash it then says edit. So that's gonna be your sheet ID, just copy that over here. So we need that. Then the tab that it's going to be called is members. And then the column that we would be able to put um, the emails in is going to be whatever column you want. I'd probably do column B, cause usually it's like name, oops, name, and then email, so probably column B. So what this is going to do is it's gonna go into that Google Sheet and then look to see what emails are there. So it's basically gonna cross-reference for us and be like, okay, yes, this person is uh, has, I don't know, been approved essentially. You can do this if it's like people that are um, already in a course, people that are already on your newsletter, things like that. Um, there's a lot of different use cases for it, but typically it's gonna be for um, like, student only groups, uh, especially if it's for a specific product. So for me, the way that I do this is I just export the CSV from, um, I find ConvertKit a bit easier than Thrivecart for it. Thrivecart's a bit weird with it. So I just export the uh, tag that is for that specific product. Then I would take that information and take it over to the Google Sheet and grab it from there. The other option is when you set up a product in Thrivecart, one thing that I do is I connect them all to a Google Sheet and then it keeps like, a running list of my students for me there. And so you could also um, just connect it to that Google Sheet as well, technically, because it'll auto update. The thing is not everyone's gonna use Thrivecart, so it does depend on what you're using. Um, and also I find with Thrivecart, sometimes it just doesn't like populate things quite right. So it's up to you, but you, you can try either way, basically. <laughs> Then down here we have auto decline. So this is also going to allow it to say, no, you should not be in this group. And what I typically do is I will enable it, um, but I'm going to go through these criteria. So I'm not just going to be like anyone can be removed. Now, admin assist can also do most of this. What I think is interesting is that admin assist doesn't necessarily block people who have blocked you or like who their accounts are suspended. So that's one that I really do like to have turned on. Um, I do decline member requests if a couple of days have passed because that typically means that they haven't been approved to join the group. Um, so I give it a, a bit of time, but I might even go in manually and notice it by then. And then basically if they don't meet all of the auto approved criteria, they'll be removed. So here's like one that I think is most important is decline if their email is not entered in any of the answers. So the above one is going to auto approve them, but if they if it didn't auto approve it and they were just kind of stuck there and we didn't auto decline, it would just stay there. And I don't want to like clog up the member um, request area with a bunch of like dead applications. So this will go in for me and deal with that for me. 
Then uh, decline if no questions have been answered and decline if members did not agree to group rules. Because of the um, does not meet the above auto approved criteria, I said two questions. If they do not answer at least two questions, they will also be declined. And then here we can set it to a certain number of months. So then we're going to update auto approve and decline settings. And then there we go. We are now ready to basically have people approved and declined. So to have this running, you are going to need to make sure you have Group Collector as a Chrome extension and turned on. And then as it says here, you do need to have like Chrome open. Now for me, that's not a problem because I am chronically online. I use Google Chrome most of the time um, because of the Chrome extensions, I quite like them. But also because I am one of those bad people who never turns my laptop fully off. So Chrome is kind of always running somewhere. Um, so for me, that hasn't been an issue. But if you like turn off your computer for the night or the weekend um, and you don't have Chrome open, it's not going to be able to run and auto add people. I think that that's a little bit of a like hindrance and I do wish that there was some way that they could circumvent that because a lot of people like the point is that they don't have to be online and I do think it's not very good for the environment for things to just be like running all the time um for me it's usually running because I have like Netflix or other things open as well like I will say I do sleep um, but even that I sleep with Netflix running don't judge me I, my sleep habits are not great um so that's why I have it kind of open to run, but most people like are not on their computer constantly. So I think it'd be really cool if they could find a way to circumvent that, but I don't know if the Facebook API would allow it. So then up here, you would just turn on enable auto approve and auto decline. And if you turn that off here, it will override the settings on the dashboard. And that's basically it. Group collector is pretty easy to run. Once you've done it once, it gets a lot easier. And then you're gonna have this like really handy um, spreadsheet where you're gonna have a bunch of information. So I love this because it gives me, um, first of all, like it has the emails, which I really appreciate. I also find for courses or for even like, I used to have a membership on Facebook. And one of the biggest problems was whenever um, somebody would like decline a payment or they decided to just like end their membership, which was fine. The problem is that their name doesn't always match the name, like the, their Facebook name doesn't always match their credit card name um, or like their name in Thrivecart. And so I'd have to try and figure out who everybody was and it was so annoying to go through that admin of trying to track who everybody was. And what I really appreciate here is that it will tell me their name and their email in one spot. So this makes it a lot easier to manage any sort of paid group and to make sure like, okay, if someone's becoming a problem or if you had any like, I don't know, I had a couple plagiarism issues last year, then because I know their email address, I can associate which account it is because I wouldn't have let them into the group if they don't give me an accurate email. Um, so now I know which account to remove. So it's gonna give you their names as well, which is good. But then these questions help tons as well because you're gonna find out a lot of information. And I think membership questions are one of the best ways to do like market research. So one of my favorite questions that I ask is how did you find me? Like, how did you find this group? And it's been so telling because I can tell like which podcasts or summits I did that did the best. I can see when like a podcast kind of stops working over time. I can see like if um, my SEO efforts are paying off. I can see all sorts of like ways people are finding me. And interestingly, I can see that like my Facebook SEO methods are paying off because I'm found a lot through Facebook, which is really great. So that gives me a really great amount of data on how people are getting here. And since we don't have anything like Google Analytics to track it, this is a really helpful way to understand the path people are taking to get into the group. It's also basically creating a little database for you of any of these questions that you might ask that are market research for like, what are people struggling with? Um, what is their experience level? Whatever kind of questions you wanna ask, you can get a lot out of this. It is really going to tell you a lot with um, your future marketing efforts and what you should post in the group. Now we also have some extra things like, uh, it had like the date they joined Facebook earlier. I don't really care about that, so that doesn't matter to me. It has their location, doesn't massively matter to me, but it is kind of helpful where we are kind of, with cookies not actually getting phased out, but G4 already phased them out. Um, we don't have as much demographic details as we used to, so this is a good way to get some. I don't really care about mutual friends or common groups or friends in groups, I think that's kind of, irrelevant to me, but I mean, if you care, you care. I do like that I can see who's inviting people. So if someone is um, inviting people to this group, if I use like an invite URL for a limited time, then I can get a good sense of like, okay, this person's referring a bunch of people, or I'm using this invite link for like a limited promotion. 
look, a bunch of these people came from it. Um, that is helpful, again, for market research. So is Group Collector worth it? Short answer, yes. Honestly, I if you'd asked me two weeks ago before I figured out turning off that auto like focus thing, I would have said no. I would have said this is a hellscape. Get me away from it. But especially right now at time of recording, it's still available on AppSumo for a lifetime deal of $79. That's $79 and then it's going to let you like do unlimited group. On their website as well, they do have a lifetime plan for $297. So like you're getting a steal, like a proper steal. You can also get it for $25 a month if you just want to test it out and see if it's for you. Um, but I would say both on their website and on AppSumo, there are money back guarantees. So either way, you are able to test to see if it is right for you. Now, do you need this if you've just started a Facebook group? Probably not. Like if you're getting, I don't know, like a member a week or something, I'd like to believe that you are okay to copy and paste that one person into ConvertKit to check their email address. But if you're doing it en masse, if you're running multiple Facebook groups, if you're just like time poor, I think it is a really good option, especially if you have something like I used to where you had a membership where you do need to cross-reference those um, payment details. That Maybe I'd still have my membership if I had that. Um, there's a video on this channel that, about why I shut it down and the admin was a big reason and dealing with like rebuild issues and things like that was a big reason. So this genuinely could have changed the game for me. Now there are other softwares out there too. And honestly, I think I haven't tried them all yet, um, at least at time of recording, maybe later by the time you're watching this, I will have tried everything knowing me that happens pretty regularly. Um, but it feels like they all work decently similarly. And really the thing that matters to me here is that it's able to collect those email addresses, that it's able to auto approve and auto decline. That is really, really helpful. Um, and that it is able to do so without disrupting my workflow now, because I do not want my workflow disrupted. I think every single one um, would collect those membership questions. I can't imagine them not. Um, I do think it, it feels a bit clunky the way that it currently connects to a Google Sheet. However, in the end, I did really appreciate the Google Sheet. At the beginning, I was like, oh, this looks like, I don't know, I coded it somehow, which like then later I tried to code a Facebook API and I can fully admit, oh, it is above my pay grade. <laughs> so it is, um, yeah, like it is a complex piece of coding. It is very good, very helpful, and it saved me a lot of time. So I really appreciate that, especially as someone who moderates all of my Facebook groups myself. I do not have moderators, so cutting out any time for me is very, very helpful. So I would say that I recommend this if you have a Facebook group where you are collecting email addresses, where you need anything auto-approved or auto-declined, and if you want to have like any data collected in a spreadsheet automatically, where it's going to save you some effort there. Otherwise, like if you have a Facebook group just for fun, if you have like no email collection, you don't really ask membership questions or you don't care about them, then no, don't get this. Honestly, like don't spend the money. You don't need it if those are not details that you're concerned with. I know a lot of people start Facebook groups without any of those things. So then you don't need this. If this video helped you decide to get Group Collector, I would appreciate you using my affiliate link to make the purchase. I'll have both the AppSumo and the direct affiliate link in the description below this video. At no additional cost to you, I get a commission if you use those links. Um, and I will have both just in case the AppSumo one, whenever it eventually, usually things are only on there for a limited period of time. Now, if you want more videos like this, hit that subscribe button. I post a new video every Thursday uh, where we go through different tools like this that can help automate your processes and different tips and tricks for running an online business. Now, if you wanna watch another tutorial, I'm gonna put up a tutorial that I did and a walkthrough I did for a tool called Reword. It is an AI tool that most people don't know of that is really, really fun for um, training it on your voice, getting some statistics, and then also being able to write content long form. Uh, and yeah, people don't really talk about it enough. So that's gonna be on screen now for you to go watch. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day and I will see you guys next Thursday. Bye.